Thank you for coming again. <laughs> you lasted. <laughs> Good. Uh, we'll uh, remind ourselves a little bit of what we did yesterday. Uh, we began with the book of Deuteronomy and speaking about how, uh, why we need to study it as Christians. Uh, and then we talked about how different scholars have been studying the book of Deuteronomy through the years. And we saw different theories of higher criticism. We spoke about the diachronic and the synchronic method. And we saw that the diachronic is more interested in uh, history, in how each uh, event is uh, dated and how it's put into the book. And how this process uh, casts doubt on the claims of the scripture itself. Uh, on the other hand, the synchronic method studies the book as a whole. As a, as a unity, as if it's all written at the same time. Uh, and then we began to study some of the uh, different covenants, the political treaties that have been discovered. And how they relate to the form of Deuteronomy, how the form of Deuteronomy has copied some of the elements of the ancient treaties. Uh, and we finished uh, with the topic of love because we went to the famous Shema of Deuteronomy 6. And we saw how love in the context of a covenant is a duty. Uh, it's a debt. God has every right to demand love from uh, His people. Because love is not uh, a feeling, it's, it's a dedication and devotion to the interests of the king. And the Shema basically uh, tells you who is this God. It tells you that Yahweh is one, there is no other God. There is no other uh, father for you, he is your father. He is the one who gave you life, who brought you into existence through the exodus. Uh, he's given you everything, he's given you the whole life that you possess, the whole identity that you have. And the only appropriate response to this is for you to love him with your wholeness. As the Shema says, with all your heart, all your soul and all your mind. Uh, so this is your wholeness, your oneness. So the response of his people is supposed to reflect what God has done. God has taken his entire identity. Uh, his unity. Uh, his oneness. Uh, his uh, dedication, energy, will. Uh, تدريسه, uh, talk to, Determination. 
تركيزه وتحديده all his attention was brought together to look at you كل تركيزه كان ان هو يرعاك وينظر اليك all his timelessness came together into a moment in history كل اللازمانية بتاعته جت في نقطة واحدة اتجمعت في نقطة من الزمن Everything that you can now imagine with the fullness of revelation, the entire Trinity. كل حاجة اللي نقدر نفهمها دلوقتي بالإعلان استعلان الكامل عن السلوس. United in one purpose to love you. التوحد في هدف واحد إنه يحبك. To dedicate itself to you. عشان يكرس نفسه لك. To be at your service. عشان يبقى في خدمتك. So. Before this great event, before the infinity of God coming together to love you, could anyone imagine a different response to this love? Can any حد يتوقع رد فعل المحبة دي? Than the submission of our entire existence, body, soul. بغير ان غير ان الواحد يرد بمحبه بكل ما في الواحد من قلب وفكر وقدره your thoughts your mind your actions is there anything that has escaped the sphere of this relationship كان في اي حاجه هربت من محيط العلاقه دي is there anything that we are allowed not to submit and هل في اي حاجه احنا مسموح لنا ان احنا ما نحطهاش تحت خضوع للمحبه دي this is a perfect relationship هي دي العلاقه الكامله and in fact if you hold something back you're punishing أنت وفي الحقيقة أنت لو خبيت حاجة وراك ده أنت بتعاقب نفسك. Imagine the relationship between two people. تخيل علاقة بين شخصين. The the best example here is marriage. أحسن مثال هنا هو الزيدة. To people getting married, they are expected to give everything to each other. The two متزوجين متوقع أن هم يعطوا كل حاجة بعضهم لبعض. They even stand naked before each other without shame. حتى بيوقفوا عراء أمام بعضهم البعض. There is nothing that they hold back from the other person. ما فيش حاجة بيخبوها عن الآخر. With no shame, no hesitation. من غير خجل من غير تردد. Absolute mutuality. في تبادلية كاملة. And I think that this is the reason that God has given the sexual relationship in marriage. To teach us about this, not for for its own sake. عشان يعلمنا دي مش في مش للهدف خاص بنفسه. But as a shadow of how closely and how absolutely we are demanded to mutually give ourselves to Him. بس كمثال وكظل ازاي احنا المفروض نعطي نفسنا في تبادل علاقة مع كل ما فينا ليه. Can you imagine a couple on the wedding night? تخيلوا اثنين متزوجين في ليلة زفافهم. One of the spouses stands in front of the other and they are standing naked before the other. واحد من الزوجين واقف عاري امام الاخر. And the other member refuses to remove their clothing. والآخر لا مش موافق إنه يخلع ملابسه. And they say, I draw the line. I married you. I don't owe you anything more. أنا جوزت ما جو أنا تزوجت معك بس أنا ليس ذاك حق أكثر من كده. I have given you a lot. I'm not obliged to give you everything. David, عطيت كثير من مش مطالب إن أنا أعطيك كل حاجة. Is this marriage? هل ده جواز؟ I don't know what the laws are in Egypt, but I know that in England or the States, for example, the non-consummation of the marriage is an annulment of the marriage. ما أعرفش القوانين هنا في مصر إيه، بس في إنجلترا أو الولايات المتحدة عدم إقامة علاقة جنسية ده بيبطل الزيجة. The marriage is cancelled if you do not give yourself completely to the other person. الزيجة بتبطل لو أنت ما عطتش نفسك بكاملة للآخر. What makes us think that we can have a covenant with God without giving ourselves completely? اللي خلينا نتخيل إن إحنا يكون عندنا علاقة مع الله بدون أن ندي له كل حاجة. We already saw the political dimensions of love in Deuteronomy. نقدر نشوف البعد السياسي للحب في التثنية. 
But the book itself has this uh, marital dimension as well. بس الكتاب نفسه عنده البعد الحب الزوجي بين الله والإنسان. It is the, another place in the Old Testament where the same language of the Shema exists. في مكان تاني في العهد القديم. زي ما نفس اللغة دي بتاعت التسنية هو سفر نشيد الأنشاد. The erotic song of the Old Testament. ال ال sorry. The erotic song of the Old Testament. الحب الجنسي أو المزوجي بين في العهد القديم. In this book, the the woman continuously says. He is the one my soul loves. في الكتاب في الكتاب ده ال المرأة بتقول هو ده من تحبه نفسي. This language that my soul loves. اللغة دي اللي هي بتقول من تحبه نفسي. Is borrowed from the Shema. مستوحاة أو مستلفة من الشيمة. And we see that it's understood in a marital way. وهي مفهومة إن هي متخدة. ف طريقة زوجية. So God Himself is leading us to interpret the covenant in in this analogy with marriage. فربنا بيقودنا إن إحنا نفسر العهد بطريقة زيدة. In our days, in our modern world, we continually speak of the sexual identities and the tendencies that each person has. في العصر الحديث بيتكلموا على التوجهات الجنسية وكل رأي مختلف. But according to scriptures, the the scriptures. بس تبتون الكتاب. The primary sexual identity of people is divine love. بس ال الهوية الجنسية الأولى هي الحب الإلهي. We receive our existence from divine love. بناخد بنستلم وجودنا من الحب الإلهي. We experience divine love in our encounter with God. بنختبر الحب الإلهي في مقابلاتنا مع الله. And our only future is divine love with Christ. ومستقبلنا الوحيد هو حب إلهي مع المسيح. And to this divine love, both marriage and singleness are signs pointing to it. وفي الحب الإلهي ده العزوبية والزواج هم بيشيروا لل لنفس الحب ده. So divine love is our primary and final sexual orientation. If you like. الحب الإلهي لو نحن نقدر نقول كده هو بداية ونهاية التوجه الجنسي. And and Christians should have this framework when they enter into discussions about sexuality in our days. والمسيحيين محتاجين يكون عندهم الفكر ده لما يدخلوا في أي نقاش حول التوجهات الجنسية في العصر الحديث. So Deuteronomy is much broader, of course. It speaks about loving God with all of one's soul and the and the heart and the might. The might here, I want to say something. Okay. طبعا تس التسنية بيتكلم عن المحبة من كل القلب والفكر والقدرة. هنا حاجة على القدرة. It's it's a very curious word that is not used in this way elsewhere in the scriptures. هي كلمة بتصير للفضول عشان مش بتستخدم في حدة تانية في الكتاب. It's not the usual word for mind. مش من كلمات المعتادة للقوة لكلمة القوة. So it doesn't mean you should love God with all your muscular strength. مش معناها إنك تحبه بكل عضل قوات العضلية. It's a word that means your fullness in a sense. هي كلمة بتعني كل اتمام الأرك. Your muchness. كل حاجة فيك يعني. Because this is an adverb, odd, a lot. It's not really a noun. هي مش مش اسم بس هي ما مش سمع. Ah, it's okay. So what it refers to is actually all all the things that give you economic strength. هي كل حاجة بتديك قوة اقتصادية. It's your buying power. 
هي دي القوة الشرائية عندك your material power أو القوة المادية عندك love God with your economics تحب ربنا بالاقتصاد اللي عندك and this is very relevant for the book of Deuteronomy because it deals with economics very much وده ليه علاقة كبيرة قوي بسفر التسنية عشان التسنية بيتكلم كتير قوي على الاقتصاد who is able to love God in this complete holistic way مين يقدر يحب الله في كل الطريقة المتكاملة دي We all fail in this. كلنا بنفشل في الحتت دي. But the Old Testament speaks of one person who managed to succeed in this. بس العهد القديم بيتكلم على شخص نجح في ده. Only one king managed to love God with all his heart and all his soul. ملك واحد قدر يحب الله من الفكر والقلب والقدرة. Do you suspect which king it is? تتوقعوا مين؟ It's not David. It's someone we mentioned over and over and over again yesterday. Josiah. Of course. Do you blame the critics? This is the text that we have about Josiah. Which says before him there was no king like him. بيقول لم يكن قبله ملك مثله. Who turned to the Lord with all his heart. وتدرج على الرب بكل قلبه وكل نفسه وكل قوته. According to the law of Moses. حسب كل شريعة موسى. Nor did any like him arise after him. وبعدها لم يكن مثله. He was the best. هو كان الأفضل. No wonder critics think he wrote the Deuteronomy. يعني عشان كده ما يعني ما بنفكر برضو ليه النقاد قالوا ممكن يكون فعلا هو اللي كتب تسنية. Today we will see more topics in the book of Deuteronomy and because I will not be able to cover every single chapter I just sorry. النهاردة هنشوف مواضيع مختلفة في سفر تسنية بس عشان طبعا مش هنقدر نغطي كل إصحاح من إصحاحات التسنية. I just want you to have a look at the outline of the book. عايزوا تشوفوا صورة عامة خطوط عريضة للسفر. There's three sermons, three distinct sermons that Moses preaches. في ثلاث عظات مختلفة وعزهم موسى. We will discuss a lot in this area in the first sermon. هنتكلم كتير عن الحتة الأولى العزة الأولى. And tomorrow we'll we will see particular laws and how to interpret them. وهنشوف بعد كده بعض القوانين وإزاي بتتفسر. And the book closes with the blessing of Moses and the preparation for the succession of Moses. وبيختتم الكتاب ببركات موسى وإعداد للخليفة لخليفة موسى. Because, as you all know, he's about to die. عشان هو نزلنا تعرفين هو على شرف الموت. He's not permitted to enter the land. هو غير مسموح له إنه يدخل الأرض. So in fact, these sermons are the last words of Moses. في الحقيقة التلات عزات دول هم آخر كلمات موسى. And if someone knows that he's dying, ولو حد عارف إنه هو هيموت, and he collects his children around him, وبيجمع أولاده حوله, to give him his last words, عشان يديهم كلماته الأخيرة, you can imagine that he's saving the most important things about life. تتخيلوا إن هو بيحفظ أهم حاجات عنده من جهة الحياة. To tell them to as an inheritance. عشان يقولهم ك ك ورسين كأولاده. So these sermons have a lot of intensity. فالعزات دي فيها تجديد جامد. People usually don't remember many sermons or many words of a person's life, but they remember their last words. بدأ كثيرا ما الناس تنسى عزات أشخاص كثير بلكن بيفتكروا آخر كلمات للشخص ده. They are hanging from his lips. هو متعلق من شفتي. So let's look at the last words, some of the last words of Moses in the thirty-first chapter. في آخر كلمات موسى في التسنية واحد وثلاثين. Because he really wants them to remember his words, he doesn't want them to be forgotten. عشان هو كان فعلاً كان عايزهم يفتكروا الكلام اللي كانوا عايزهم ينسوه. So Moses commanded them every seventh year in the scheduled year of remission during the festival of booths when all Israel comes to appear before the Lord your God at the place that he will choose you shall read this law before all Israel in their hearing assemble the people men women and children as well as the aliens residing in your towns 
so that they may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God and to observe diligently all the words of this law, and so that their children who have not known, known it may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as you live in the land that you're crossing over the Jordan to possess. Every time the people of Israel gather together and they hear this sermon, it is a reenactment of Moses collecting his children again to give them his last words. And the effect is the same. It's like the effect they had when they first heard the word on Sinai. When you hear the sermon, you fear God. So for Moses, it's not like God spoke once and then it's not the same thing really. Many people want a fresh word from God. Yeah, they don't want a frozen uh, sermon. <laughs> We don't want to read again and again old stuff. stuff. We need fresh words from heaven. And God does have a fresh word from heaven. If God spoke once, and if this was the voice, not of a dead person, but of a God who is who is alive right now. Then it's always fresh. Fresh. <laughs> and this is this is how the sense of the canon is being born. The sermons of Moses, if they are indeed the word of God. If you copy them and you reread them and you repreach them, them then it's identical to him speaking every time. It becomes holy scripture. So it became holy scripture for the Israelites. Because Moses describes it every time you meet and you hear, you will fear God. The same exact effect that you had the first time when you heard his voice in your own ear. But another reason that the Torah must be reread and reread uh, is because there's new members and new descendants. New people are being added in the bride of God جديد, all the time. So we must renew our vows every time. So when we read the scriptures in public, it's like we are renewing our vows together. We are re reorienting our identity in case we have forgotten who we are. In case we have forgotten who our God is and what is our history. So when I read my Bible with others, I renew the covenant. I renew my vows and I enter the covenant of God again. The last uh, book of the uh, Christian canon It's the book of Malachi. And even the final words of the prophet Malachi send us back to the beginning. He closes by saying, Remember the teaching of my servant Moses, the statutes and ordinances that I commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. So the end sends you back to the beginning.
Okay, so the first sermon of Moses is the first four chapters, five chapters. And as you know, uh, introductions, the beginnings of books are very important in the scriptures. Uh, they determine the climate of the whole book. They usually give us the emphasis of the book, its direction. And then the, the unfolding of the rest of the book usually follows uh, the intentions that the prologue is giving. You may be thinking of uh, the Gospel of John, the prologue of John, which basically in this prologue he sets the, the pace for what will follow. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He came to what was his own, his own people did not accept him. All these things, we will see them unfold in the whole book. الكلام ده في البدر كان الكلمة والكلام كان عند الله والكلام من كلام الله بنشوف الكلام ده كله إنه ده هو ده اللي هيشرحه بالتفصيل بعد كده في كتابه. So we must pay a lot of attention to prologues because they provide the framework. لازم ندي اهتمام مهم قوي للمقدمة عشان هو ده اللي هيشرح إيه اللي هيحصل بعد كده. And the same happens with the Book of Deuteronomy. وده بيحصل بالضبط في كتاب سفر التسنية. The prologue gives us a lot of information. المقدمة بتدينا معلومات كثيرة. And it begins, these are the words that Moses spoke to all Israel beyond the Jordan in the wilderness. So, it tells us who the speaker is. Uh, he tells us what we should expect in this book. And we mentioned yesterday that this is words. وشوفنا مبارح إنه الكلام هو ده الاسم سفر التسنية. ما بيقولش قوانين. عشان عايز تفكر في الكتاب ده بصورة أوسع وأكبر. كلمات وعظات موسى بيديها لشعبه. And so law is part of those speeches. It's not the main thing. From the from the from the words of Moses, there are commands. They are not all the same commands. And in this way, laws that come in the book are to be interpreted within the climate of the word. And in this way, we understand the commands that are present in the climate of the word. هو بيتكلم مين المستمعين هم جميع إسرائيل. and it tells us where this is given. وبيقول لنا ده حصل فين. it's not given in the land. ما ت ما ما عطاهمش روا الأرض. it's given in the wilderness. عطاهم في البرية. in the wilderness is important. والبرية مهمة. because the audience is not here or there. عشان ال المستمعين مش هنا أو هناك. it's in the middle of nowhere. هما في وسط لا شيء. He is in a place that is very far from his past. هو في حتة بعيدة أوي عن ماضي. And he is in a place that is always on the brink of his future. وهو في حتة دائما هي على خطة قريبة من المستقبله. And the best moments in the history of Israel happen in this gap. وأحسن أوقات إسرائيل حصلت في الفجوة دي. In this void. في الحتة الفراغ ده. The greatest worship event that happens in history happens in the wilderness in Sinai. أحسن فترات عبادة حصلت في البرية في سيناء. Even though the wilderness is associated with non-existence and death. مع إن البرية مرتبطة بعدم الورود بالموت. What turns the wilderness into the most important experience in the life of Israel? إيه اللي خلى إنه البرية تكون أهم خبرة في حياة شعب إسرائيل؟ It's the presence of God. هو حضور الله. With the presence of God. At the space where you feel that you're hanging from nothing by a thread. Especially in a context where you are not at your home. بالأخص في سيارة إن أنت في مكان هو مش بيتك. Where nothing belongs to you. ومفيش حاجة تملكها. It's at this space 
that you experience him to the fullest. في المساحة دي وفي المنطقة دي بتختبره في ملء الخبرة. It's in this context that God unites with his bride. في السيار ده الله بيتحد مع عروسه. It's at the context where your hands don't hold anything. You have lost everything. These are the moments that usually carve out your relationship with him and your future. هي دي اللحظات اللي بتحفر علاقتك فيها مع الله وفي مستقبلك معه. The prophets of Israel knew very well the significance of the wilderness. أنبياء إسرائيل فهموا قوي فهموا رأس قوي أهمية البرية في شع في حياة شعب إسرائيل. The wilderness was the honeymoon of God and His bride. البرية كان هو شهر العسل بين الله وعروسه. And when they enter the land and they get comfortable. The prophets are reminiscent of the the time in the wilderness, the honeymoon of the people of God with Him. And let's look at the words of Hosea, for example. Therefore, I will now allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. From there, I will give her her vineyards and make the valley of a whore a door of hope. There she shall respond, as in the days of her youth, as at the time when she came out of the land of Egypt. On that day, says the Lord, you will call me my husband, and no longer will you call me my Baal, for I will remove the names of the Baals from her mouth, and they shall be mentioned by name no more. So you see, he's, he's thinking of the wilderness, as a time where they had their pure love with God. It was not contaminated. With other gods and, the, and transgressions of the covenant. It's where God had pity on them. So let's see a little bit about the time of... Uh, uh, okay, this is Hosea still. Let's go back and see uh, what it says about the time. بيقول هنا إيه من جهة المعاد أو الزمن. It tells us here that the distance between Horeb, which is Sinai. بيقول لنا هنا المسافة ما بين حريب اللي هي السيناء. And Kadesh Barnea. وكادش بارنيا. Is eleven days travel. It takes safar 11 days. So from the time that they received the covenant, من اليوم اللي استلموا فيه العهد, to the time they're supposed to enter in the land, من الوقت المفروض يدخلوا فيه الأرض, it's just eleven days. أو بفترة 11 يوم. And what is the next sentence? إيه العبارة التالية? In the fortieth year. في السنة الأربعين. We're still here. لسه عادين هناك. So the the author wants to stress this astronomical difference of time. The writer wants to explain the difference in time. The writer wants to explain the difference in time. The writer wants to explain the difference in time. The writer wants to explain the difference in time. The writer wants to explain it's supposed to shock us this difference, this detail. هي التفصيلة دي يعني مفروض إنها تهزنا جامد. It's a it's a it's a it's an unnecessary, ridiculous delay. هي غير مبرر تماطل غير مبرر لشعب إسرائيل. We are still in the desert because. The people hesitated. إحنا عادين في البرية علشان الشعب تردد. Are they were they excused to hesitate? هل كان من حقهم إن هم يترددوا؟ They are even more inexcusable because the text mentions. ما لهمش أي مبرر علشان النص نفسه بيقول. That in these years they had two additional great victories. علشان هم في خلال السنين دي كان عندهم اثنين نصرة زيادة. On top of the Exodus victory. بإضافة على نصرة في الخروج. Okay, here you can see a little bit. Of course, the place of Sinai is debated among scholars. 
but uh, many of them think it's somewhere there. طبعا مكان الجبل سيناء uh, عليه جدالات كثيرة بس uh, إن بيت, الناس بتتفق أغلب الناس بتتفق إنه في المكان ده. And they were supposed to arrive at Kadesh. المفروض يطلعوا عن كادش. And enter from Kadesh. ويدخلوا من كادش. So for 40 years they are going in circles. <laughs> في خلال 40 سنة بيلفوا في دوائر. Around the mountains of Edom close to حوالين Seir. حوالين جبال أدوم. And now they went up in the valleys of Moab. This is where uh, Moses will die. And the new plan is for them to enter through Jericho. So the talks, the words of Moses are given in this area. فكلمات موسى اعطاها في المنطقه دي. But they have defeated two more kings. بس هم انتصروا على ملكين اخ اثنين تانيين يعني. Sihon and Og. سيحون وعوج. So not only the exodus in Egypt. مش بس الخروج في مصر. But this this journey was not a, a miserable journey in the wilderness. بس الرحلة دي ما كانتش رحلة مأساوية في البرية. It was a journey of continuous miracles. كانت رحلة فيها إضافة وتكميل للمعجزات. God never abandoned them in this journey. الله ما سبهمش أبدا ما سبهم في الرحلة دي. And now we are at the second. Chance. We are. We find ourselves before the waters of Jordan. فبنحنا بنلاقي نفسنا بجانب مياه النهر الأردن. Moses in one five. موسى في واحد في صح واحد عاد خمسة. Tells us something about his role in this book. بيقول لنا حاجة من جهة دوره في الكتاب ده. Moses undertook to expound this law as follows. ابتدأ موسى يشرح هذه الشريعة. Undertook to expound. يشرح. So this word to expound shows us that he is not the lawmaker. كلمة يشرح بتقول لنا إنه مش هو صانع القانون. His role is to explain, to interpret an existing law. دوره هو يشرح ويفسر قانون صابت الورود. He's a commentator. هو معلق عليه. And what this word means in Deuteronomy means to make clear, to clarify. Clarify what the law means. يوضح معنى القانون إيه. And of course, this is not merely the words of Moses, interpretation of Moses. وده طبعا مش معنى إنه هو ده تفسيرات موسى مجردة. But in one three, he tells us just as the Lord had commanded him to speak. بس في عدد ثلاثة بيقول حسب كل ما أوصاه الرب. So even though this is his interpretation, he's explaining the law. مع أن حتى هي دي تفسيرات وشروحات. There's no differentiation between God's word, what God commanded him to say. ما فيش فرق بين كلمة الله القوانين اللي قالها. And his own words. وبين تفسيراته الشخصية بتاعت موسى. Now it says to expound this laws follows. فبيقول ابتدأ موسى يشرح هذه الشريعة الرائعة. And after as follows, we expect to see the law. وبعد كده بنتوقع نشوف الشريعة. And see how he explains it. ونشوفها يشرحها ازاي. But law does not appear in the first five chapters. بس الشريعة ما بتظهرش في أول خمس إصحاحات. What we see is a story. اللي بنشوفه هي قصة. Moses regards what he's doing in the book of Deuteronomy as teaching. موسى بيشوف العمله في سفر تسنية كأنه تعليم. He is using this verb for himself, lamad. بيستخدم الفعل ده لنفسه اللي هو لمد. And there's two conjugations in Hebrew. وفي تصرفين مختلفين في العبري. With lamad, if lamad is used in the PL conjugation, lamad في تصرف PL. It means I'm teaching. معناها أنا أعلم أو يعلم. But if lamad appears in the cal conjugation, لو لمد بين في تصرف الكال. It means I'm learning. معناها أنا أتعلم. So so when the Torah is in mind in the book of Deuteronomy, لما التوراة تكون في الذهن في كتاب التسنية. Whenever it's used for Moses, it's with the PL. لما بتستخدم بجد موسى فهي بتستخدم تصريف PL. So he's teaching the Torah. لأن هو بيش بيعلم التوراة. And the role of the hearers is to learn the Torah. ودور المستمعين هم يتعلموا التوراة. So that they can also in turn. 
teach others with care and especially their children so that the Torah passes to the next generation now in 1.6 uh, we begin with the words of Yahweh he says you have stayed long enough at this mountain <laughs> it's very interesting the mountain is usually the, the place of God's presence it is a temple if you like but even though I am with God and I'm enjoying his presence in the mountain and one would say where else would you want to be but in the presence of God well, they are at Horeb in the very presence of God. So there is security, there is peace there in His presence. There is warmth. But his plans for his people is not to enjoy the warmth of his presence. His plans are their mission. They, they have a mission. In a sense, a lifetime that is lived in the presence of God but is not moved towards a mission. It's not very different from sitting in Egypt. None of the two is God's will. So he doesn't like you to be in Egypt. But he doesn't like you to be a stagnant Christian either. And we may have both types of people in the church. He doesn't want us to be slaves. Or to warm the seats of the church. <laughs> Because in the second uh, case, not in Egypt but at the mountain, Israel is a slave to his cowardice, his timidness. Being the people of God means a constant openness to the unknown. Yes, to what is dangerous very often. It's an opening to the future. To conquer the future. Not the fear of the future. It means movement and change. From the thing that gives us comfort and we are used to. It means we are already in readiness for the coming exodus. The purpose of the exodus was to teach the people what to anticipate in their future. Yes, it was a unique event in history in their past. But they're not supposed to stay stagnant now and just uh, remember how nice it was when we came out of Egypt. Maybe they should stay stagnant now the Exodus says that God is ready to perform more Exoduses. So get up and go. Turn and move on and enter. Uses three verbs of movement. The first verb, panu, comes from the word panim, which is face. And it basically means turn your face. Turn to your direction. It's a conscious decision to reorient yourself. To the goal that's out there. Uh, one nine reminds the Israelites 
again. في واحد تسعة بيذكر الإسرائيليين. That God has kept His promise. إن الله حفظ عهده. The promise is given to Abraham in Genesis 15:5. في العهد اللي ده لإبراهيم في تكوين 15:5. But he's wishing Moses is wishing for further fulfillment of this. بس موسى بيأمل في اكتمالات أخرى جاية في المستقبل. He's he's telling him in Genesis that look uh, look towards heaven and count the stars. If you're able to count them, then so shall your descendants be. بيقولوا so في تكوين بيقولوا ثم أخرجوا انظر إلى السماء وعد النجوم إن استطعت أن تعدها وقال له هكذا سيكون نسلك. This is the promise and ده الوعد. In one ten he says I've done it. في تسنية واحد عشرة بيقول أنا عملت ده. God has multiplied you. الرب إلهكم قد كسركم. You're as numerous as the stars. وهذا أنتم اليوم كنجوم السماء في الكسرة. But in the next verse. بس في الآية التالية. He says, "May the Lord increase you a thousand times more." بيقولهم ليزيد الرب عليكم مثلكم ألف مرة. It's not finished. ما خلصش ما خلصش. They're not supposed to rest in the fulfillment. فعش يريحوا في التتميم. So the whole book has a sense of already and not yet. فالكتاب كله عنده فكرة إنه تم وليس بعد. God has acted, has freed, has gifted. الله فعلا فعل بالفعل وحرر ووهب. So get up and go and acquire what is gifted. فأوم وتحرك وأحصل على ال على الهبة اللي أنت خدتها. Because he's about to continue completing and fulfilling. عشان هو هيكمل تحقيقه للوعد ده. So we're not finished. عشان كده إحنا ما انتهيناش. In one nine to eighteen, Moses introduces the topic of democratization of leadership. فواحد من تسعة إلى تمنتاشر موسى بيشرح دمقراطة السلطة. Right from the beginning, notice that they've seen God do miracles in Egypt, and this is how the Exodus was affected. ما نوم شافوا معجزات حصلت في مصر وهو ده إزاي الخروج تم. But now you're grown-ups. بس أنت دلوقتي بقيتوا بالغين. Now you must learn to manage each other. ده لازم لازم تتعلموا إزاي تتعاملوا مع بعض. To manage the community with justice. علشان تديروا المجتمع بعدل. And how will this happen? وإزاي ده هيحصل? With wise organization. ب تنظيم حكيم. So you have to appoint. For administration, your leaders. لازم تعين للإدارة كوادة. And what's your criteria? وإيه هي الكريتيريا بتاعتك? Do not pick the tall and the powerful. ما تختارش ال. And the pretty. الطويل والحلو والقوي. They have to be. They have to be tested. They have to be wise. لازم يكونوا مختبرين. They have to know the Torah. لازم يكونوا حكماء. لازم يكونوا عارفين التوراة. They must not be biased. They must not be racist. They cannot have the appearance of being 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 racist. Why they must fear no human? ليه ما ينفعش يخافوا حد؟ Well, because only the fear of the Lord counts in this book. علشان هو في الكتاب ده الحاجة الوحيدة اللي يعمل معمول حسابها هي ما خافة الله. The minute you start fearing a human, you will alter justice. وفي اللحظة اللي فيها تدي تخاف إنسان هتغير العدل. So you cannot have judges in Israel who fear a human. ما تقدرش تلاقي قضاة في إسرائيل بيخافوا إنسان. The topic of fear. موضوع الخوف. So they liked the advice of Moses to appoint leaders. حبوا فكرة موسى إنه هو يعين قادة. Because there's internal issues of justice that they need to be taken care of. علشان في مواضيع داخلية خاصة مرتبطة بالعدالة محتاجين حد يهتم بها. And as every community knows, there will be imposing people in the community. ودائما زي دائما أي مجتمع في ناس بيفردوا نفسهم في المجتمع ده. And they must not fear these people. ما فعش يخافوا الناس دي. And do justice in their favor. وما عملوش عدالة في عدالة في صلاحهم. The issue of fear is also found in their history, their encounter 
with the people in Kadesh Barnea. موضوع مخافة الخوف برضو مورود في تاريخهم في مقابلتهم في Kadesh Barnea. Because it says you have reached the hill country of the Amorites, which the Lord our God is giving us. See, the Lord your God has given the land to you. Go up, take possession, as the Lord the God of your ancestors has promised you. Do not fear or be dismayed. So fear is coming from the Amorites, which the Lord our God has given us. Look at the Lord our God, the Lord in front of you. So fear comes again and again as a main topic in the book. This is the 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 main topic in the book. Okay, we won't fear, but let us send some spies into the land so okay. that they can examine the land. خاف, and they can collect some information so we can know the way to go. And with this intention, Moses agreed. Yes, وبالطر... it's a good intention. There was nothing wrong with this request. Uh, Joshua will do this. the same thing later in the book uh, 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 this, uh, uh, so while Moses thought that this is a very prudent way of going about conquering the land they want to prepare themselves better in order to attack This was not the reason, basically. Because this prudence had some human fear hidden in it. خوف, it was a disguised refusal to obey the word of God. It was a cover-up. They were buying time. But it appeared as prudent. So the same action can have two different attitudes of heart. You can send spies to prepare the way because you're determined and ready to go and you want to do it well. And But you can send spies also to confirm your fears. Because you want to avoid going in. There is a word play here. Uh, because the text says in 122 uh, that they want to send spies so that they can walk before them on the way. But in 133 the text says that God continually walked before them in their journey. He was already leading them into the unknown. But what are, what are they doing here? They're trying to substitute God with safer means. So here we see what each person wants to hear in Kadesh Barnea. واحد عايز يسمع ايه هو مفروض يشبرني موزس فوكس اون ذا جودنس اوف جاد موسى بيركز على صلاح الله فوكس اون هيز كايند انتنشنز بيركز على النيات الطيبه ا ات سيز ان جاذرد سم اوف ذا لاندز برودوس ويتش ذي بروت داون تو اس ذي بروت باك ا ريبورت تو اس اند سيد ات از ا جود لاند ذات ذا لورد اور جاد از جيفينج اس واخذوا في ايديهم من اسمار الارض ونزلوا الينا وردوا لنا خبرا وقالوا جيده هي الارض التي اعطانا الرب الهنا ذيس از وات موزس سو فروم ذا ريبورت هو ده اللي موسى شافه من التقرير But they let fear distort their theology. But so they let fear distort their theology. Fear was able to distort the character of God that they knew. Fear let them distort the character of God that they knew. And distort his intentions for them for their future. And distort his intentions for them for their future. And distort his intentions for them for their future. ناخد بالنا من الصفات من تعاملهم. Your tents and said it is because the Lord hates us that He has brought us out of the land of Egypt to hand us over to the Amorites to destroy us. 
Where are we headed? Our kindred have made our hearts melt by reporting the people are stronger and taller than we. The cities are large and fortified up to heaven. We actually saw there the offspring of the Anakim. Did they hear different reports? Did Moses hear something different than Musa the Israelites hear? الناس no, they were given the same information. They were shown the same pieces of evidence. But the predisposition is different. So many times the issue is not that someone doesn't have enough evidence to believe. في بعض الأحيان مش بس إن الواحد ما عندوش أدلة تكفي علشان يؤمن. Fear and disbelief. الخوف في عدم الإيمان. Or the deep desire to return to what is familiar. بس ال الرغبة العميقة في إنه يرجع لما هو معتاد. And safe for me. وآمن لي. Are extremely strong factors. هما تفعلا عوامل قوية. Almost impossible to overcome. تقريبا مستحيلة الانتصار عليها. And they can determine our hermeneutics. وكان يقدروا يحددوا تفسيرنا للأمور. Hermeneutics is the study of interpretation. Hermeneutics, اللي هي تفسير ال دراسة تفسير. So these are not impartial researchers. فدول مش ناس غير محابين بحسين غير محابين. They all see the same data. أو كلهم بيشوفوا نفس المعلومات. But they focus on their doubt. بس بيركزوا على شروطهم. Fear has determined how they will interpret. الخوف هو اللي حدد إزاي دوري يفسروا نفس الدلائل دي. So you will see that very few people believed that this evidence that they're seeing are evidence of a good land. بعض الناس شافوا إنه دلائل دي هي دلائل إنه الأرض صالحة جدا. What is able to convince a person is deeper than their logic. اللي يقدر يخلي الناس تفهم حاجة أعمق من منطقهم. It's the disposition. To trust yourself to the unknown. إن الواحد يكون جاهز إنه يصد يصد نفسه بال في المجهول. Trust yourself even in circumstances you will not control. إنه ال في تصد في أوقات فيها الظروف حواليك أنت غير قادر على التحكم فيها. This is why many people think that the study of apologetics, apologetics does not really save anyone. لاش كان الناس بتفكر إنه دراسة الدفاعيات مش بيخلص حد. If this person is always suspicious. لو الإنسان دائما متشتت. If they have a disability of trusting. لو عندهم عدم قدرة على الثقة. So sometimes apologetics works more with the people who are already believing. بعض الأحيان عشان ده الدفاعيات بتشتغل مع ناس هي already مؤمنين. They're already trusting. Already هم بيأثروا. Saint Augustine said, "Believe that you may understand." This Augustine will say, "Amen, until you become a believer and understand." So it's not understanding the evidence that will lead him to faith. It's not the fact that he understands the evidence that will lead him to faith. And later on, Anselm picked up the same idea from Augustine and said something similar. And after that, Anselm took the same idea from Augustine and said something similar. I'm not trying to understand that I may believe, but I believe so that. أنا لا أحاول أن أفهم حتى هو من وقت يوم من حتى أستطيع أن أفهم. But notice that how the Israelites are magnifying the problems. بس لاحظوا أن الإسرائيليين بيبلغوا في المشكلة. The person who fears will exaggerate the problems. الإنسان اللي بيخاف بيبلغ وبيتربر من المشكلة. But no matter how many problems you can identify, مهما كان عدد المشاكل اللي تقدر تحصرها, the truth cannot change. الحقيقة لا يمكن تتغير. The land is a good land. الأرض هي أرض جيدة. It is a good land that the Lord your God is giving us. هي أرض جيدة هي الأرض اللي الله بيعطيها. What follows from here, from where you're standing, is good. اللي بيالي مما بدل لما أنت فيه الآن هو صالح هو جيد. Before this declaration. قبل الإعلان ده. You cannot bring. But how will it happen? I don't have money. What will they say? They will come after me. This and that. There are many things that I can do. I don't have money. 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 I don
then I'm always guilty for not conquering. فأنا دائما مذنب إن أنا ما رحتش وقت حمتها. If the land in your future is good, لو الأرض اللي في مستقبلك جيدة, then I'm always guilty for not going there. فأنا دائما مذنب إن أنا ما رحش هناك. The unknown with God is always better and safer. Than the present. المجهول مع الله هو دائما أأمن وأحسن من الحاضر. You are not permitted to define the future in a different way than He has already. أنت غير مسموح إنك تعرف المستقبل بطريقة أخرى غير الله حر. Because the future is the creation of God. عشان المستقبل هو من خلقة الله. And like the first creation of God, He is the one to determine and define whether it's good or bad. وزي الخلقة الأولى هو الواحد من حقه يحدد هل هي جيدة أم لا. No one has the right to define how this land will be. ما حدش من حقه يقرر الأرض دي هتكون إزاي أو ملزاي. The only creator of the future is God, and only He defines it. الخالق الوحيد للمستقبل هو الله وهو اللي يحدد عملزاي. The future is a sphere that no other God has control over. المستقبل هو مكان أو وجود ما حدش من الاله الأخرى عارف يوصل له. No other God has sovereignty over the future. ما فيش أي حد من الاله الأخرى عنده سلطان على المستقبل. It's his own sphere. He created it and he's calling you into it. هو المكان الخاص وهو اللي بيدعوك لي. So here, what we have is idolatry of the future. هنا اللي بنشوفه هو عبادة أصنام المستقبل. What is the idolatry of the future? هي يعني إيه عبادة أصنام المستقبل؟ The idolatry of the future means that I attribute to another power the sovereignty of the sphere of the future. عبادة أصنام المستقبل معناها إن أنا بأنسب سلطان قوة أخرى على المستقبل. If I think that any other power might have control over my future, it's idolatry. لو أنا بفكر إنه في أي قوة أخرى لها سلطان على مستقبلي فده عبادة أصنام. Just like God had to break this understanding that there's different gods that have control over geographical spheres. زي ما الله كان لازم يدمر الفكرة دي بأن هما معرفة إنه عندهم آلهات تكسيرة كل آلهة عندها المنطقة الجغرافية المست المسيطرة عليها. He also had to break this belief that there's other gods who have control over the temporal sphere. هو كان برضو لازم يكسر الفكرة دي إنه في آلهات أخرى عندها سلطان على المستقبل. No one else has authority over the future. ما حدش تاني عنده سلطان على المستقبل. The only way that you can fail and not reach this future. الطريقة الوحيدة اللي تخليك تفشل وما تخليكش توصل للمستقبل ده. Is if you doubt its definition. لا هو بدأت تشوك في تعريفه. Is to start questioning whether it's good. Did the church get hell? How it was or not? Is to start being uncertain whether God has given it. The next short, how far is Allah to hold it or not? Is to start thinking that it's threatening when God has already conquered it. يا بتفكر هل هي فعلا تهديدية مع إن الله فعلا ارتحمها. And if God has said this future, this land is good. ما الله قال إنه الأرض دي والمستقبل ده جيد. And you're questioning that. وأنت بتشوت في ده. You're seeing God as not good. أنت بتشوف إن الله غير صالح. This is exactly what the Israelites did. هو ده بالضبط اللي شعب إسرائيل عملوه. God hates. الله أبغضنا. This is why he brought us out of Egypt. علشان كده أتخرجنا من مصر. If you're not falling into the hands of the future, like a a baby that's jumping over the bed into the arms of the father, مش لو أنت شتري نفسك للمستقبل زي ما طفل بيرمي نفسه في أحضان أبوه. You're essentially saying God does not love; He hates. أنت أنت بتقول في الأساس إن الله مش بيحب الله بيبغض. And this thing Moses calls rebellion. وده موسى بيقول عليه عصيان. You're unwilling to go up. أنت لم تشأ أن تصعد. عصيتم كون الرب إلهكم.
So you lose what is good when you stop believing in its existence. بتخسر ما هو جيد عندما تمتنع عن أن تؤمن هو عن وجوده تؤمن بوجوده. You lose life when you stop believing that it exists. بتخسر الحياة لما بتبطل تؤمن إنه موجود. And we see this in John. ونشوف ده في يوحنا 3:36. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. الذي يؤمن بالابن له حياة أبدية. Whoever disobeys and here the Greek word is rebels is the same like here. في الترجمة اليونانية هي هي يعصي. Whoever disobeys or rebels against the Son will not see life. لن يرى حياة. But must endure God's wrath. بل يمتوس عليه غضب الله. Christ is the future. Yes, the Messiah is the future. Christ is good. The Messiah is صالح. If you don't trust that, you lose it. لو مش بتصد في ده بتخسره. You lose the life. بتخسر الحياة.